Hey, good morning, everybody. Keep coming in. We're so glad you're here. It is Palm Sunday today. Now, if you're new to church or the Christian faith, you may not know what that is. Well, it's the first day in what we call Holy Week. This historically has been a really important week in the calendar when it comes to church and uh, just how we do things because we are anticipating Easter where we get to celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, if you're new to the crossing, let me just tell you this. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus like every weekend. Uh, in, in fact, we think that's one of the reasons he's worthy of all of our worship. It's just good for us to be reminded of the hope that we have in Jesus. Yes? yes. I mean, there's some of you here that agree with me on that, right? Okay. Now we're ready. So uh, here's the interesting thing. Do you know that uh, it's not just us that worships God, but actually all of creation, scripture tells us, worships God. Listen to Psalm 96, these words. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them, let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord. If all creation rejoices before the Lord, well then maybe I think we should join in, don't you think? So stand up, we're gonna sing together, let's hear ya. Just as Tim said, let's sing this together, all creatures. And all creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Thou burning sun.
and hope. So we praise the Father, we praise the Son, we praise the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Boy, you all sound good this morning. Look, there's somebody around you who's just wondering if coming to church this morning, someone's going to take a second and say hi to them. So would you just turn to the people around you and say, welcome, and then go ahead and have a seat. Uh, Well, as we uh, get ready to head now into this week, we have this Easter celebration that is coming up next weekend, and uh, I hope you're making plans to be here. I hope you've invited your friends, you've got it figured out, the schedule's all arranged, but just one more time, in case uh, you aren't sure yet, let me show you the worship times. These are all of our services up on our screens. Uh, Lots of options there, starting with Friday evening, and there are services at our campuses as well. As well, getting ahead of myself, I'm just so excited. Um, Listen, if you haven't made plans and you want to know, the question that always comes up is which is going to be the, like, the most attended services, which ones do we avoid? And we always tell you, we don't know what you people are going to do. <laughs> so I don't know. 
Uh, our best guess, though, is Sunday morning. People like to come to Easter on Sunday morning, right? And, uh, and that 945 service especially, we're guessing, is going to be pretty heavy. And so if you're flexible and you can come Friday night or Saturday evening, then that, uh, that might be a great way for us to just keep making space for our guests who are coming to hear this story in many cases for the first time. Uh, our doors will open 30 minutes prior to every service, and so get here early. Um, in fact, we'll make sure that while you're sitting waiting for the service to start, there's some interesting things for you to learn about. There's going to be some cool moments we'll get to experience together even before we start the service. So come join us for all of that. One last thing about that, if you have uh, guests who are coming and they have kids and they want their kids to experience Kids Crossing, they can pre-register online for Kids Crossing, and that will save them time. Uh, it will uh, save them some stress when they come, and so let them uh, know that they can do that, okay? All right, that should set you up for success for next weekend. Uh, here's what we want you to do. We're, we're gonna head back now into our conversation today, and to do that, we want you to talk to each other, and we've got a question for you. So here's what we'd love for you to talk to each other about real quick. Um, if you guys can put that question up, it's what was the last thing you misplaced or the last time you misplaced something, okay? Group confession time, just tell the people next to you. All right. So what was it? First of all, let me just say welcome to those of you who are here, those of you who are watching online, those of, of you who are at Fenton, those of you who are in overflow at Fenton, those of you who are at Mid Rivers and Grants Trail. We're just really excited to, to do this together. But what was it? Like, what, what was the last thing you misplaced? Anybody got anything for me? Phone. phone. Like, phone seems to be the number one answer, right? Keys. Yeah. Did you know there's all sorts of research? Yeah, okay, I got it. Uh, so, so, so there's all sorts of research out there that shows, like the average, on average, we misplace nine items a day. Does that seem about right? You start going through them all. What is it? So phone, keys. What is it that you set up there? Eyeglasses. Yeah. Uh, kids. <laughs> Remote. Then the remote again. I mean, there's sort of all sorts of things. We forget things. So what? It doesn't matter how old you are. We forget things. I love that new Uber Eats ad campaign. I've been seeing it during the games. To remember something, you've got to forget something old. Have you seen that one? Like uh, the Beckhams, uh, David and Victoria are, are, are trying to, you know, they've remembered Uber Eats, but they're, they're trying to remember. They forgot the group that she was in. Hello, 1990s, if you were there. And they keep trying to, is it Pepper Ladies? No. Is it Cinnamon Sisters? No. It, was it Spice Girls? No, that doesn't sound right. So the point is, I don't know how all of this works, but I will tell you a few things. Your brain, and this is a very technical drawing of your brain, I know, uh, but your brain uh, takes in all of this information in this outer area called the cerebral cortex. Now this is where all of the senses just soak it all in. But what you need to know is the next, sort of the next uh, stage of this is that all of that information gets taken in. But at some point, like right in here somewhere, there is uh, something called the amygdala. And it's the amygdala that flags something worth remembering. It's the part of your brain out of everything that's going on that goes, Oh, you should remember that. And you zero in and you pay attention and you focus on and you log it in. And then this is a really simple way to put it. But then it gets sort of tucked into uh, like your filing cabinets uh, in the hippocampus. Uh, and all of this will be on a pop quiz in a minute. Uh, no, just see if you can remember this part. Because then there's the frontal lobe that tries to retrieve it. Who cares, right? Who, thanks, Professor Trivia. What's this all about? The research shows that one of the things, no matter how old you are, one of the things that gets in the way of us remembering is in that second stage with the amygdala. We get all this information, but we don't honestly stop long enough to focus in and go, yeah, I need to flag that. That I want to remember. Does that make sense? 
it explains why you can go to a party and you meet all sorts of people and you, you introduce and, it's, and you get like 10 minutes later and you go, man, those were some great stories. And somebody says, so who were those five people? I don't know. I don't remember their names. It was just five minutes ago. But your amygdala did not flag it and go, no, I need to remember that. That's his name. You see, the other parts of the research show that we are getting worse and worse at paying attention. Amen? I said the research shows that we are getting worse and worse at paying attention. Amen? There it is, there it is, there it is. But there are some times when something happens, it's so vivid, the details come alive. Maybe it's like, a, a, like all of these uh, like different parts just come together and it's almost like a snapshot of something and you go, oh, and it's a big aha moment. When that happens, oftentimes that snapshot, that gets paid attention to, you tuck that away. And if you go back to it again and again, that memory actually becomes richer. You will remember it. So as you already know, here we are. It's Palm Sunday. Can you believe it? It's Palm Sunday. We're going to look at a story that for some of you is familiar. For others of you, parts of this will be new. I hope that as we see now, all of these threads, all of these details and names and places and promises and predictions, they're all going to keep coming together, maybe even almost crashing together. But as they do, my prayer is that there'll be something in there that you will pay attention to, that you will notice, that you will flag and say, ooh, that's worth remembering today. So let's pray. I don't know if you know this or not, but we have entire prayer teams that intercede for people, and they've kind of been mobilized this week. They're in each of our rooms praying, and they'll be praying for me, but right now, if you are one of those intercessors, I'm going to ask you to pray for everybody else in the room, if you would. Heavenly Father, we come before you now. We're going to continue in times of worship and teaching and opening your word, God. There's so much that you're going to lead us through. But I pray now that for each of us, no matter whether we're new to the story or we know everything about the story, Lord, I pray that you would surprise us, that you would help us to stay curious and humble and eager and open. I know that your word says that, that the cross can be uh, foolishness for some. I pray now, Lord, that you would that you would show people just exactly what this means and how you are inviting them into a life that they can't even fully imagine. Lord, we're asking all of this now in your name for your glory. Amen. Okay, so here we go now. Um, if you were with us uh, last week, we were in Jericho. Jericho, we heard a really important, uh, I think profound, beautiful word from one of the descendants of the great E.M. Bounds. If you were here last week, you'll remember that. We like to call him Pastor Tim. If you don't get the joke, you should, you should watch the, the teach from last week. It was important. But we were in Jericho. Now, I told you two weeks ago in Jericho that we were gonna, Jesus, we with Jesus are gonna take an 18 mile trek into the wilderness up to Jerusalem now. That's exactly what happens. And it is wilderness and it is uphill if you've ever been there. But they're now going to move to, John tells us, to a place called Bethany. Now this is a Google map and we're gonna zoom in here and see Jerusalem and there's Bethany and we'll talk about that other little village. Mostly what I want you to see is the topography. Bethany sits on the backside of what we would call the Mount of Olives. Now we just went over it, there's Jerusalem. Now let's flip it around. Of course, that's not the temple. That's a a Muslim site now, but you can see the Mount of Olives just sort of overshadows the city of Jerusalem. I want you to understand, John tells us that they are coming to a place called Bethany. It's on the backside of the Mount of Olives. It's about two miles away from the city. You can't even see the city from there. It's a great place for Jesus to hang out during this holy week, as we call it. But they're getting to this place and something is now going to happen. Now, the, the rest of it, if I could just show it to you here, uh, the rest of it is that you begin to see there's Bethany, of course, uh, where he is. But there's another village that we're going to get to. So see if you can imagine this now. Because it's, it's Sunday. It's the first day of the work week. Saturday is Sabbath. So Sunday is like our Monday. Everybody is there. It's busy. Everything is happening. History tells us that maybe tens and tens and tens of thousands of people have gathered. There's an ancient historian that said over a million people gathered. Some people think he overstated it. But let's just say even hundreds of thousands of people have now 
pushed into Jerusalem. They're all there to celebrate the great feast of Passover. John tells us that they arrived in Bethany just days before Passover. But what they'll now do is they'll now make the trek from Bethany on the backside, and they'll go up this ancient road to a place we would call it Bethpage. In the Greek, it might be Bethphage. It's, it's, uh, but they're going to make this trip, and they will then go in towards Jerusalem. So now watch how all of these details come together. In Matthew chapter 21, what we begin to see is they approached Jerusalem, and they came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. So you're getting a sense of all of this now. Jesus gives instruction to a couple of disciples to go on ahead to this little village and pick up a donkey colt for him to ride on. It's only a one-hour walk into the city. This isn't about him being tired. He is intentionally making a statement. The Gospel of Matthew from week one of this series, we said he's always the one that connects the ancient Hebrew prophecies to the story of Jesus. That's what he does here. He says there was a prophecy by Zacharias centuries earlier that said Messiah will enter Enter the city just like this on a donkey colt. And so sure enough, Jesus is intentionally saying to the crowd, it's me. Everything you've been thinking, it's me. So now look at their reaction when they realize this. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and chose uh, and those that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. We learned last week, this is a way of saying Messiah. So these people are coming unglued. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. They think, finally, finally, he's it. And it's really a raucous crowd. But as Jesus now makes the, the, like, gets over the peak of the Mount of Olives and he starts to come down this ancient road towards Jerusalem, if you've ever been there, you can see when you're on the Mount of Olives, like Jerusalem is right in front of you. You can't ignore it. And the gospel writer says when he saw the city and he saw the temple, he wept. He wept. Why? Well, he knew. He knew. He knew that they weren't interested in the kind of kingdom he was describing. He knew that uh, it would only be a few days from now and people would start screaming for his death. He knew that they wanted a different kind of Messiah. They wanted a military leader. He knew that what they wanted was a bloody confrontation with Rome. Now, if you keep reading, he knew where this was leading. In fact, he even predicts it. You see, in 70 AD, just a few decades later, Rome has had enough of this attitude, and they lay waste to Jerusalem, level the whole thing. The temple is destroyed, and that's it. It has never been rebuilt. He knew. He knew that something was about to happen that was going to shake heaven and hell to its core. And these people didn't want any part of it. You see, Jesus the king is now about to move into the city. But when I say that he's about to move into the city, he knows that he is heading towards his death. He's been telling the disciples this for weeks now. Another detail. A thousand years earlier. Can you even imagine that kind of time frame? A thousand years earlier, Jerusalem is barely established as the capital city. Something happened right here on the Mount of Olives. David, the King David, has been betrayed by his son Absalom. There's a coup in process. And so David gets wind of this and gathers his entourage and has to escape Jerusalem quickly. So he gets his people together. They gather, they run out of the palace, and they begin to escape for their lives. It's exactly what he should have done. God's not finished with him. David needs to live to fight another day. But where did David go? 2 Samuel 15 tells us. Look at this passage and see, David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. Now, maybe this is just me, but I'm seeing David moving up and out of trouble. It's exactly what he should have done. But David is weeping as he's going up the Mount of Olives, away from the city, away from trouble. And when I read the story of Palm Sunday, what I see is my Jesus, my King, coming down the Mount of Olives, weeping, knowing that he will be betrayed, knowing that there is danger for him and imminent death, but he doesn't run away from it. Jesus, my King, enters the city that day, knowing what is ahead of him. 
You see, for me, I can't even fully explain the love of my God who says, I'm gonna enter into the trouble. I see what's happening and I will go into and face my death. You see, that's the story of our king who is absolutely in charge this entire week. For me, when I consider this, when I consider this idea of the king moving into the trouble instead of, the way, instead of away from the trouble, and I begin to ask the question, well, why would he do that? And it comes back to you and me, and that he's doing this out of his great love for us. Why, why, why wouldn't we respond in worship one more time? Does that not seem like a good thing for us to do right now? Absolutely. Amen, David. Would you all at each of our sites now join us as we worship our King? All my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must stay. just one move with my arms stretched wide I will worship you so I throw up my hands praise you again and again cause all that I have is a God's 
sometimes there just aren't words. God, who are we that you would be mindful of us, that you would go to the lengths of the cross so that we might be in relationship with you? We're undone. What we have, we give to you now. We give to you now in worship and in praise. We thank you for Jesus and all that you are. Amen. Amen. Y'all can go ahead and have a seat. We actually thought that this might be a good time in light of everything that we're getting ready to celebrate together this week to just stop for a second and say thank you. To say thank you to those of you who serve and give of your time and your talents in so many amazing ways. I mean, as you begin to create safe space for kids and kids crossing to come and hear who Jesus is and build relationships with them. When uh, those of you who, who serve in our youth crossing and keep helping, helping students figure out their story and have God's inviting them into this. Those of you who lead small groups and classes and, 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 and and help us pull all of those kinds of things off. For those of you that help people feel welcome from the parking lot all the way to their seat here in this room. For those of you that serve on our creative teams and our music teams and lead us in worship in such beautiful ways that help pull off all of the technology and all of this place and people who you can't even see in this room who are making all of this happen. We're just so grateful for the way that you continue to serve. You need to know that, that, that we all do this, those of us who serve, do it from a grateful heart because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And that also goes for people who give of not just their time, but their treasure. See, there are some of us who have absolutely been so undone by what Jesus has done for us that one of the ways we worship is we invest our financial resources into what he's doing in his local church. This is it also an act of worship. When we gather together on the weekends, we pray, we sing, we open up God's word, but we pause every weekend for what we call our offering, our tithes and our offering. And maybe you have questions about that, but that is simply a moment where we take an opportunity to say, God, I wanna give everything to you. And sometimes that even means I invest financially in what you are doing. For those of you that do this, it's amazing. We are so grateful and we are praying that God would bless you in it. But ultimately it all comes down to this grateful heart because everything we do, all of this worship, all of it happens in the shadow of the cross. It's because of the cross that we even get to do this together. And we're so grateful. So would you all lead us in that song one more time? Could we just sing that? And let's express our gratitude to him for all that he is doing in our midst. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a question. Thank you, guys. Some of you are going to come back, right? Okay. All right. Um, why would he head into the trouble? Well, this has been predicted for so very long. Let me take you now back to the, to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So we're here um, right around the time that he's being baptized. And this fellow named John the Baptist says something really uh, fascinating to me. Uh, he, he sees Jesus and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, let me just help you with this. I think you know, but when he sees Jesus standing before him, he is not saying, behold, this guy is a baby sheep. He is, of course, using what? Metaphor. He's using metaphor. Now, we've talked about this. These are the ways that God will teach his people about his love, his holiness, his plan. This is something that he does. One writer says that when you go to the Old Testament, you see these, it's, it's almost like pencil sketches of things in these metaphors. But by the time you get to the New Testament with Jesus, it's like in full view. You see it just all filled out in, in full color. Now for us to understand this metaphor, which by the way, is all 
over the scriptures. Like it's, it's everywhere in the scriptures. But this idea of the Lamb of God, we'll just make an M like that. Uh, the Lamb of God shows up in so many different places. So we just said in the Gospel of John, uh, honestly later I can show you that it's in the book of Revelation. We won't even have time to go into that today. But we're gonna go way back in the story now to the Exodus and the time of the Exodus. And if you understand uh, anything about this, you, you'll remember some of you because you've read it, some of you have watched the movie, but you know this is the time when Israel is trapped in 400 years of slavery. God hears their cry, raises up a fellow by the name of Moses. You probably know him. And Moses now goes to the Pharaoh of that day, the, probably the most powerful man on the planet, and says, you gotta let God's people go. And there's this cataclysmic back and forth now where God is showing who's in charge. These are the plagues. These are those nine spectacular miracles that we see at first. And by the way, these take some time. And it gives people a chance, anyone who so desires to turn to the one true God of Israel. In fact, if you read the story, you will see during one of those plagues, we call them, there were people in Egypt who actually protected their livestock in a moment because they were beginning to clue in that there was something to the God of Israel. But Pharaoh has dug in. His heart has hardened. And he says, no, I'm not letting you go. And the one final horrific plague. And God says to his people, to escape this judgment, which by the way would have been for anyone to escape this judgment. On the 10th day, you are to select a spotless lamb. Now this is all in Exodus 12. And then on the 14th day, all these details, on the 14th day, you are to kill that lamb, roast it, and eat it. But take some of the blood and put it on the doorframe of your home. And I will pass over that house and judgment will not land in that house. This is where, of course, we get the term Passover. And what you need to know is that uh, this is exactly what happened on that night that is different than all other nights. But judgment comes to the palace of Pharaoh because he refuses to do this, and the people of Israel are let go. Now, the, maybe one of the first questions you're asking is, well, why did God need blood on a doorpost? Well, I want to technically suggest to you that he didn't. God didn't need that, because he's, I don't know, God? So he can see into the hearts of everyone. He knows who's in what house. He knows who trusts him. God isn't saying, now you guys are going to have to give me some reminders because I can't keep you all. No, God knows. You see, the hint that we have about all of this is in a verse where he says, this is going to be a sign for you and for the people in your house. Well, wait a minute, what is it a sign of? What, is, what, what could God possibly be teaching us? Well, I don't know. I'm just going to say a few things. See, there's something here about sacrifice. There's something here about judgment. There's something here about... Um, a substitute? You see, because if you want to know the story of the Passover, a lamb died, so a family member didn't have to die. Now, it's just, this is what's going on here, but I, I think that God is, is, is teaching these people as we go through, and he's teaching them about a lot of things, but I, I really do want us to understand as we look at this that it doesn't take very long before they get out, they're free, and the people are sinning again. They're just doing these horrible things, and God pulls Moses aside and says, now we've got to come up with this system where there's going to be sacrifice. You're going to sacrifice lambs and goats and sometimes bulls, and you're going to have to remind the people daily that they need my forgiveness that sin is a big deal and this sacrificial system was actually in place in Jesus day they were sacrificing animals at the temple in Jesus day and the next question you have is I don't like this part of the story see I don't know why we have to talk about such barbaric things because it does feel barbaric doesn't it so let's just admit that out loud and then let's ask the question what could God possibly be teaching them well, let me tell you one thing he's not doing. He's not saying your job is to pay off an angry God. God doesn't need lambs. God says in the Psalms that he owns the livestock of a thousand hills. 
God doesn't need any of this. Uh, the death of a, of a lamb isn't going, to, isn't going to push back darkness and evil in this world. That's a weird kind of a paganistic thought there. God isn't impressed by mere religion. So what is he teaching? I would just say this. If I were in that day, the, the death of a lamb wouldn't like, cause God to, to, like it doesn't magically make him forget the ugliness of my life. The Bible says straight up, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Like, it, it doesn't work that way. So then what on earth is happening? What is it that God is doing? I think it's all teaching people about how big a deal sin is. I think it's pointing to a day when God is going to take care of this once and for all. If you want to really look back, and we don't even have time, but if you want to look back throughout Scripture, I could show you a place in, in the book of Genesis in chapter 22, in another really strange story where Abraham says to his son, the Lord will provide the lamb. This has just been a theme all the way throughout. God is trying to teach these people about what he's going to do. There's going to come a day when he's going to deal with this. He's going to atone this. He's going to heal the rift. God is going to teach us about how it, it, like, sin just disrupts our relationship with him. It pulls us apart from him. It destroys the whole plan. But God says, it's all going to lead up to a day where I will make a way and I will deal with this once and for all and there'll be no more sacrifice. He's teaching them about his love. He's teaching them about uh, how desperately they need help. And he's teaching them about the cost of making things right. Now, again, this is really difficult. But let me tell you one of the most difficult things for us today is that second thing. How desperately do we need help? How about this? How easy is it for you to ask for help? Just in a general sort of a way. How many of you are sitting next to someone who has a really hard time asking for help? Go ahead, just confess for them. Yeah, yeah, some of you are afraid to do it, that's okay. Here's the thing, we, we terribly overestimate our abilities. Is that okay for me to say that? It happened three days ago for so many of you. It just did. You took one last look at all of the decisions and the choices you made about those games. And before you hit submit, you thought, you know what? I'm, this might be the first ever perfect bracket and you hit send. How's that working out for anyone? Yeah, you see, I would say that like, if I were to just suggest that there's sin in the world, I don't think most people are going to argue with me. It's like, oh, yeah, we see evil everywhere. But we point it out in the lives and the failures of others. How good are we at admitting our own stuff and our own failures? Because I will tell you what, if we can't admit our own stuff, it gets in the way of any relationship, any relationship. There are a couple of uh, social uh, scientists who wrote a book called Mistakes Were Made but not by me, okay? How's that for a title? <laughs> and what they found was that when it comes to couples in particular, there were a couple of things that just destroyed relationships. They said, of all the people that we've studied, it looks like there's two things that just rip up a relationship. The people who grow apart over years, it's two things, blaming and self-justification. What they're saying is that people just get really good at saying, it's your fault, look, look at what you did, look at what you did, but nobody owns their own stuff. In fact, this is the quote from the book. From our standpoint, therefore, misunderstandings, conflicts, personality differences, and even angry quarrels are not the assassins of love. How's that for a phrase? Self-justification is. When you and I are in a relationship and something, we did something wrong and then we minimize it or we kind of justify it and go, ah, it looks like that kind of hurt you, but I was kind of justified in doing that. Sorry, not sorry. Isn't that what Jesus said earlier in the series? I came for the sick. Like I came for people who are willing to admit that they need help. If you think you're righteous, you're not going to listen to me anyway. Now, the good news of the gospel is this. For any of us who are willing to say, I'm desperately in need of help, God says, I've got you. I've made a way. This is what the story is all about. Now, I want us to take a break right now, and we're going to talk to some people around us. I'm not going to ask you to share your darkest moral failure, so don't worry about that. But let's just flip it around. When you are the forgiver, not the forgive-e, but when you are the forgiver, 
what is the hardest part of forgiveness? Y'all just talk to each other. What's the hardest part of forgiveness? Go ahead, chat with each other for just a second. Welcome your neighbors. If they don't want to talk, then you just, you know, share what you're thinking. Okay, all right. Here in this room, I know there's some interesting conversations going on elsewhere. Like over in this section, anybody got anything for me over here? Like, like what's the hardest part of forgiving? Anybody? The forgetting, okay. Now, what's interesting is come to our G Genius of One course because we'll talk about how it's impossible for you to forget. Part of the forgiving is that it will help you with the idea that you simply won't forget. Mmm, good plug for the class, come join us. Uh, yeah. Uh, because you will have to get to a place where you ultimately forgive, and then when that comes up, then you, anyway. Okay, what else? It's really important. The hurt. Say it again. The hurt. the hurt. So somebody did something to me, and it hurts. What do I do with that hurt? That's really good, really good. Anybody else got anything? The trust. Did you say pride? So it's, in, it's, it's the pride that, that, I have, that I have to get over before I forgive someone. Ooh, that's a, that's a thought. So does that mean that we get a little self-righteous in these moments? And, and then you put that with the hurt and the fact that I can't forget it and it's just churning. Anything else? Vulnerability, because now you're vulnerable and we need to talk about it's okay when you forgive to still establish boundaries. Again, there's a course where we talk about this. But uh, so, so it's, yeah, so all of that. How about this? Anybody here, like, and it's a little bit of what's going on with the hurt and maybe the forgetting, probably not you because you, 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 you're better than me, but, but, but the, the, all of that, the pride. Part of what gets churned back up is I need you to fully know what you did to me and I need you to kind of feel it. Like I need for there to be a little payback. Can the preacher get an awkward mm-hmm? <laughs> Anne Lamott puts it like this. This is her definition. She says forgiveness means it finally becomes unimportant that you hit back. Let's see if I can show you what I mean. Brian, Dave, would you guys come up here for a second? Um, They've been planning for this all week. I, actually, I just told them 10 seconds ago. So yeah, just stand here, David, and you stand here. Okay, so this is just here. You guys face each other. So this is a, uh, this is a theoretical, but let's theoretically say that David, you could say he stole, or maybe he just borrowed without permission, but he, your car, man, didn't even ask you, and he wrecked it royally. <laughs> now, here's the thing. You've got a couple of choices. Okay. We could go down the whole legal road and those consequences and all of that. But for you personally, there's a couple of things that could happen here. Like, uh, you know, you, you could, you know, oh, by the way, he can't pay it. He doesn't have any insurance. He's got nothing. Okay. <laughs> so he stole your car, wrecked it miserably, and he can't, like, he can't do anything. Hang on one second. Like, let's just, since it's a scenario, what car do you want it to be? Go on ahead and just really reach out there. What, what car is it like? Ferrari. A Ferrari. Ferrari. Okay. All right. <laughs> so if, it fun. so it was fun, you said. Okay. All right. Inexpensive. <laughs> oh, by the way, by the way, you, you see that? He's not sorry. <laughs> but now go the other way. What if he was sorry? What if he just looked at Brian and said, I'm sorry. Does that fully make things right? So you got a choice here, man. 
Like you could say for the rest of your days, you're going to pay me back. And it's a Ferrari, David. Right. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to ruin your financial life. It's going to crush you, whatever saving, gone. And you're still paying and you're still paying and you're still paying, right? You could watch him hurt for, the, for years. I, I'm going to suggest to you, it's not going to help. Yeah. I don't even think it's going to help in here. It's, in fact, it's going to make things worse. Mm -hmm. But that's a different part of the story. You could also forgive him. Now, if you truly, truly forgive him, and if you're going to let it go to the point where even when it comes back up, you get to come back to God and go, nope, I let it go. Part of that means you're going to have to pay for your car to be fixed. See, if he truly forgives you, you've got nothing to pay because he paid it all. You feeling that? You're absorbing the whole mistake, the hurt. You're absorbing all of it, and this is a part of what it means to forgive. Now, again, we were kidding about G1, but that course talks about boundaries and all of those other parts. I just want you to focus on the cost of forgiving. You with me? All right, thank you. You guys are off the hook. Here's the thing. Uh, yeah, well, go ahead. Yeah. He stole a Ferrari. You're going to applaud that? Um, um, the, the thing that I want you to see is that uh, most of our life isn't that simple. Most of our life has all of these different nuances in it. But I want you to understand that when you forgive someone who has done something to you and there is hurt and it, I mean, you feel it, when you forgive them, it's going to, it's going to involve pain. I don't know any other way to put it. Keller says it so well. He says, you are absorbing the debt, taking the cost completely on yourself instead of taking it out on the other person. And at this point, you're going, yeah, but he's God. He's all love. Why can't he just, just make it go away? Well, let me ask it to you this way. If something happens to you and it's serious and it hurts, don't you think that things can be serious to God? I mean, the God who gave us everything, the God whose holiness is so blinding we can't describe it, the God who's going to treat everyone fairly, the God who knows how it's destroying you and how it's destroying others, the God who sees everything. If God says something is a big deal, can't we just accept that it's a big deal? I mean, if things are a big deal to us, can't they be a big deal to God? And by the way, since we're not God, should we even expect that we can fully understand this? But yes, you're right, God does love us. And the story of the gospel is that God made a way and God, well, God paid the price and God absorbed the debt so that we could be forgiven. It's the story of the cross, but it takes us back to that lamb. You see, all the way throughout the scriptures, this idea of a lamb is teaching us that God is going to make a way, but it's going to cost him. Now we're in the time of the prophets, and this fellow by the name of Isaiah, so let's just put him up there real quickly. Isaiah is saying the same thing. Isaiah says there is one who is coming, who his, the, the, his, his wounds and his stripes and his, the things that are happening to him, they're going to bring healing. At one point he says, God will lay all of the iniquity on him. All sin will go on this one who is promised who is coming. But then he says this, it will, he will be led like a lamb to the slaughter. There it is again, a lamb. All throughout the scriptures you see this idea of a lamb. There is one who was promised who is going to take all of this on himself and somehow that will be enough. But he will be like a lamb led to slaughter. And now we are at the cross. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus gathers his disciples. It's Passover. It's Thursday night. Most scholars think this was a Passover meal. It's Thursday night. In the middle of this beautiful symbolic meal, Jesus takes the bread and the cup, and instead of focusing on the Passover lamb, he brings all of the focus onto himself and says, it's me. From here on out, I want you to remember my sacrifice and my death. Because it's all come to this point. It's all, all the details, all the storylines, everything's wrapped up. It's me, it's me. Take this, remember. After that meal, they're on that Mount of Olives and Jesus is, 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 is praying his heart out. But he knows there's no other way. Eventually he's betrayed by Judas. 
The temple guards come and they arrest him and they take him back to the high priest and he's convicted, not even convicted, but they accuse him falsely of, be, of blaspheming God. He's not doing that. He's telling them the truth about himself. But they don't want blood on their hands, so now they're going to hand him off to the Roman overlord in the region. His name is Pontius Pilate. Even he knows Jesus is innocent. So there's a back and forth with the local king. Finally, it's at, it's at, it's at Pilate's feet and he gives into the crowd, a crowd that I think has been manipulated by these leaders that are in the back just kind of making it all happen. But on Friday morning, Jesus is sentenced to die and the crucifixion process begins. And the next question for us is, why did he have to be crucified? Why that? Well, again, this is a real story happening in real time. These are the Roman times. This is how Rome executed people. They invented this process and it was horrific. It was grotesque. So maybe you're asking, why? Why does it have to be so grotesque? One theologian said, what if our sin was that grotesque? See, Jesus experienced all sorts of pain, but let's not overlook the physical pain. Just for a second, we're not going to go into great detail here, I promise. But Jesus was scourged. He was whipped. His skin is flayed open. Nerves are exposed. Loses a lot of blood. They jam a crown of thorns on my king, and now they force him to carry at least the cross beam of his cross through the streets, being jeered at, shouted at, spat upon by people who are now treating him in a way that you and I can't even imagine. When he gets outside the city walls, Jesus is attached to this cross at both wrists and at his feet with metal spikes, and he is left there to die like a condemned criminal. I promise you, Jesus experienced physical pain. For those of you who are going through something now and you're saying, wait, God, how can you even understand? I'm telling you, Jesus gets it. But it was emotional too. You see these people that were jeering at him, all of this crowd that is piling on saying, oh yes, let's destroy him in public. Jesus knows what this feels like. It's emotionally wrecking the abuse that is happening. He's completely abandoned by his friends. They scatter at just the wrong moment. What about the embarrassment of being stripped completely naked because this is the way the Romans did it and they attach you to a cross and now you're going to be there in front of your enemies and the few friends that you have that would dare show up. I'm telling you at every level, Jesus knows what it feels like to be abandoned, to be shamed, to be rejected. He knows, but there's even more because it's God on the cross. You see, a price is being paid. The creator is being sacrificed for the created. Jesus is fully man and he felt it all. But if you want to understand the cross, he is fully God and he experienced something at a depth that you and I cannot understand. Paul says he, was, he who knew no sin was made sin for us. It doesn't mean that Jesus became sinful, but it means in this moment, and we're in the mystery now, but in this moment that now is going to echo throughout history, all sin, all shame, all of it is being piled onto Jesus in a way that only he could withstand. So think about it. All the rebellion, the stench of regret and shame, all of the hatred, all of the evil, it's all now engulfing the only innocent one throughout all of history. It's happening as the skies darken that Friday afternoon. And it seems to come to a, to, a, to a climax, really, that we can never get away from. It seems like we come back to this every Holy Week. Jesus on the cross cries out in his everyday language of Aramaic. In fact, some people didn't even know what he was saying. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God. My God, why have you forsaken me? And sometimes that rattles us. You need to understand Jesus here is quoting a psalm. Again, it's all coming together. All of the details, all of the predictions. It's all rushing together in this moment. But he's not just quoting a psalm. He's living it out. Because in this moment, Jesus isn't just losing his life. He's losing the greatest connection he has had throughout eternity. This hyper-relational, full of love in a way we can't describe. The Trinity, something is happening between the Father and Son. Because all of this sin is on him. And we know how the Father feels about, this, about sin. So there's a 
turning away in that moment, and Jesus senses it. Yancey is right when he says, we don't even know what the father cried out, but likely this hurt cut both ways. Both of them are feeling it, and the spirit, the spirit is groaning and grieving through it all. No wonder the earth shook that day. But it's finished. Somehow, because this is God, this moment now lasts for eternity. Price is paid, a debt is settled, a ransom was given. This is the story of the cross, <laughs> this is the story of the Lamb. And praise God, it's not the end of the story. Oh, man. I'm telling you why. Come back next week. Whew. We're going to celebrate like nobody's business. This lamb stuff. You want to go to the book of Revelation? We don't have, even have time. Come back next week. Oh, we're going to talk about victory and hope. Wake the kids. Call the neighbors. you got friends that need to hear this. But for me... I'm going to pause for just a second at the cross. For me, I can't understand why God would do this fully. Why would he stick with me? I don't deserve it. I didn't earn it. It's grace. God offers his life, his love, his righteousness, his forgiveness, and welcomes me into his family at his expense. That's what happens on the cross. Now some of you have questions. You're new to this, you're trying to figure it out. That's what pastors here will be answering questions about all day, all week long. Some of you are at a place where it's like, no, I, I wanna pause and I want to remember. Well now we're going to do what Jesus told the disciples to do on that night he was betrayed. So I'm gonna ask volunteers, if they would, at each of our settings, if you would just begin to now quietly distribute the elements of communion. Now we'll take them together in, in just a minute. We'll, we'll kind of walk through all of that, but folks are gonna start just uh, distributing these elements and we're gonna give them a chance to do that, okay? But as they do that, I, I just, just wanna say that, that we're at a place now where we get, to, uh, we get to think about how we're going to recall all of this. See, my hope and prayer is that there's at least a detail or two in here that's gonna help you to remember. But while this is happening, I want you to know if, 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 if you're ready to take communion, then we invite you. If you're at a place where none of this makes sense or for you right now, this is merely an empty ritual, I wanna ask you to not, to not participate in this part. Just allow yourself to consider all of this. See, what's gonna happen here in just a second is it's gonna feel so personal and so intense that for some of us, it's almost gonna to be too much, maybe even intimidating. And there's a thought and you're gonna go, man, I gotta get out of here. I hope you stay, but if you don't, I hope you'll come back and ask questions so that we can keep moving forward. But here's the thing. All week long, we're going to consider this. In fact, we have, a, 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 we have an experience called respite that will happen on Thursday at six o'clock. The easiest way for you to get the details on that is to go to our calendar page on the website. But this is a one hour experience where we will, and we've been doing it, it's been amazing. Uh, there'll be prayer, there'll be worship, you'll have a chance for pastors to pray for you. This Thursday, be a good way for us to remember. But in just a moment, we'll do what Jesus asked us to do. We'll give thanks and we'll remember. And just like has happened for 2,000 years, many of us will begin to, to sense the life-giving presence of God in a new way as we remember. This is what we'll do. Now, we're gonna do this through a song that's gonna be sung over us at each of the sites. You'll do this on your own, not yet, but you'll have plenty of time to, to, to consider all of this. And, and the song will be sung over you, It'll be very private. And then when the song is finished, we're done, okay? That'll be it. And I would just ask you to quietly, you know, when it's time for you to leave, leave. If you wanna stay and pray, if you wanna talk with someone, do that. 
And speaking of quietly, I think it would be really great this time. I know we love to respond, and, and what a sweet thing that is. But um, let's not applaud. Let, let's allow our response to be with our heart, okay? You'll take the, the bread first, and you'll remember that this is uh, his body, which is for you. And then when you're ready, you'll... You'll, you'll take the cup, which will remind you of the sacrifice, the blood that was poured out. You'll, you'll remember this now, that Jesus absorbed the debt, that Jesus paid the price. This will be something that you and he can do together. But what I hope you'll do is behold the Lamb of God. See, all of these details, all of these things that have come together, I hope what you'll do is you'll behold him you see, what does behold mean? It means that you'll consider. It means that you'll think about, you'll grapple with, you'll be confronted by. You'll stop, you'll really notice. Oh, my prayer all week long has been that there'll just be one detail, just one thing that will, that will just, you'll put a flag in it and go, I gotta remember that. As you behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. All of the details are crashing together. They're all coming together. It's as if God is saying, I've been planning this forever, but I want you with me. So on the, 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 the afternoon that Jesus dies, John tells us in that mid to late afternoon, well, this is the exact time when lambs were being sacrificed at the temple. Even while Jesus died, there were lambs being sacrificed at the temple. John, in a weird little detail, just says his legs weren't broken. The Romans would do that to speed up the death process. And John just includes the detail. His legs weren't broken. Why? I don't know, but if you go back to the first Passover, for some reason, God says to the people, when you do this, don't break the legs of that lamb. I don't know how this works. I will just tell you that if Thursday is Passover, as most people think, then that's the 14th of the month. And you back it up to the 10th of the month, well, that's Sunday when Jesus is entering the city. Does anybody remember what happens on, on, the, on the 10th day of the month? That's when you selected the Passover lamb. Now, it doesn't say this in Scripture, and it may not have happened this way, but in my mind, I can't help but see that my king, Jesus, is entering the city at the very same time when there are un told Passover lambs being selected for a meal. Jesus is saying, I'm the king, but does anybody here see? I'm the lamb of God and I've been promised and I am doing this for you. You see, he is the king of kings and he is the son of God and the son of man and the Lord of all. He is the great healer. He is the friend of sinners. He is son of David, the Messiah. He is our great teacher. He is all of these things. But on this day, I want you to behold the lamb of God. I want you. Now, now to consider the cross and will you please remember those of you who think you are beyond forgiving there is a God that has done all of this for you because Jesus my Jesus is the Lamb of God so one more time behold the Lamb of God Crimson 
and stained He washed it white as snow Sin had left a crimson stain. He 